Bonsoir, on va commencer. Bon, on va commencer uh, notre événement ce soir. Thanks a lot for coming out. Um, this is the first time that we're, we're using this room the way, um, you know, we kind of envisioned it would be used for such an exhibition. Um, we wanted this space to be a public event space, a space for us. So um, it's a room where, of course, you get, you know, a little bit of the uh, preview, you know, with the chronology of what the content of this part of the show is. Um, but it's also a place where we can have discussions, we're going to have yoga classes in here. I don't know if you've seen that uh, we have like programming for, uh, for seven classes, I think, something like that, with uh, teachers from Luna Yoga um, down the street. Um, we're going to have mini concerts in here. We've got um, uh, Don Zell is going to do an evening, and um, Kermaha is going to do an evening, because we have to have you know the feminist <laughs> women um, presence, and uh, one honorary guy, and that's Jason Kent, and, and uh, he's, he's the leader of a band called the Sunfields. And uh, what those events are going to be is uh, a kind of a mini concert of 40 minutes, and then we're going to do um, a sing-along to give peace a chance. And a lot of these um, groups, Kermaha and Donzel, they're, they're remaking Give Peace a Chance. They're putting their own spin on it and they're bringing it into um, 2019. So we hope that you'll follow the programming and come back and we're gonna meet in this space and uh, you know, we're going to connect and hang out together and, and share stories, and maybe there'll be debates, maybe there'll be um, kind of more, op more opportunities to talk about some of the issues and some of the stories that have come up um, in a re-examination of John and Yoko's collaborative artworks for peace. Um, but for now, for our first, our inaugural event, uh, thank you so much for coming out for stories from the Montreal Bed-In. Uh, we have an incredible group of people here who have been very generous with their time and their stories. Um, je voudrais aussi uh, juste reconnaître que um, nous sommes... Uh, Cet événement a lieu sur des terres historiquement et actuellement habitées par les peuples autochtones. En tant que colons, nous sommes reconnaissants d'avoir l'occasion de nous rencontrer ici et nous remercions tous ceux et celles qui ont pris soin de cette terre depuis des milliers d'années. We would like to acknowledge that this event takes place on land, historically and currently inhabited by Aboriginal people. As settlers, we are grateful to have the opportunity to meet here and thank all those who have cared for this land for thousands of years. Um, I should introduce myself. I, I always do this. I just start talking, and I assume you know who I am, but of course, why would, I don't know, that's, uh, I won't make that assumption. My name is Cheryl Sim. Um, I'm one of the curators of uh, Liberté Conquérante uh, with Gunnar Kavarin, who's um, on his way back to uh, Oslo. <laughs> uh, also the managing director of Phi Foundation, formerly known as DHC Art. Um, and this is an incredible thing. It's like uh, f to have you, this, these people here to share these stories 50 years later. Um, this is what we're going to do. Because for some of you who have had an opportunity to listen to some of the stories, you have a little bit of the background already, right? So we, we thought it would be kind of redundant to like rehash the stories. So what we're going to do is, um, each person has been given one question, and they will have about five minutes to speak to that question. And then, you know, we're going to open it up for discussion, you know, talking about, you know, you, you may have questions for each other, and then you may have questions, but also you may have stories. And so that's when Mr. Wireless Microphone comes out, and we, we are we really, I would would like to invite you to feel free to share. Okay, does that sound all right? Um, let me introduce to you who we have. We have uh, Jerry Levitan <laughs> from Toronto. John, Jerry, in terms of the trajectory of this story, met John and Yoko um, as he, when he was 14 years old. 
disguised, found out they were staying, uh, trying to figure out where to do the next bed in, and they were at the um, King Edward Hotel, and he disguised himself as a journalist. A 14-year-old, okay? <laughs> Knew he needed to meet John Lennon, who was one of his heroes, and managed to get into the suite, um, managed to get an interview, to return to get a longer interview, and um, it inspired a beautiful um, animated film, which is also in the show. We have Mini York. Mini York, um, longtime partner with Richie York. Richie York being the first full-time rock critic for the Globe and Mail uh, in Toronto. He's an Australian, but uh, you know, spent a big part of his career in, uh, in Toronto and became close to John and Yoko. Um, you know, through t meeting them, talking to them, getting to know them, at going to Apple Records, doing his job basically, but then being so inspired by their work, uh, use, uh, you know, using music and art as tools for social change. And that really had a huge impact on his life. And, and Minnie is a lender to the show, and she's also taking care of Richie York's extensive archive, <laughs> working on it now. Joan Athey. Joan Athey is, um, really, was a really close friend to Jerry Dieter. Jerry Dieter is also in the show. Um, he had met Yoko at a party. He was like a figure in Greenwich Village and working as a photographer uh, in fashion and, um, and art and got an assignment. He, was, he you know, kind of wanted to leave New York. There was like a politics and whatnot of the United States, came to Montreal, and then kind of freelanced as a freelancer um, for, was called upon by Life Magazine to cover this bed in. And he reconnected with John and Yoko in a way where they were like, man, you gotta stay and take pictures for the entire eight days. And he did, he was the only one. And um, he took almost a, like a thousand photographs. And um, Joan became very good friends with him, um, is now the steward of his collection. And so we've uh, uh, selected and borrowed a number of photos. As, and she's also very graciously lent us the camera that he used to take most of those photographs, which is on display, as well as, and she didn't know that this was gonna happen, but she showed me a, a contact sheet, and I'm like, oh, we're gonna put that in the show, too. And she's like, e e e okay. <laughs> um, Christine Kemp, this is an incredible thing, um, and it's really, you know, it's, it's the power of sharing and you know, trying to perpetuate the story. Uh, Joan also made a book with Jerry's photos and um, in her research was able to share some other leads of people who might be good you know, to tell the story. And she put me in touch with Christine Kemp who, if you've seen the film, is the woman who offers the bedspread that is on their bed that says love. And um, this, her story is incredible uh, in that there's someone else that she thinks is really important to what, uh, what happened with her in the bedspread. And this bedspread is actually on display, a permanent display, like we weren't gonna get that, <laughs> um, at the Liverpool Art Museum. And so you can go and see it, and you can see that Christine has been now, uh, a, you know, attributed provenance <laughs> for, for the bedspread, and her story is in one of those round benches. Gilles Goujon, journalist, um, Radio Canada. Uh, at the time of your story, he was with Radio Quebec, which is now Tele Quebec. And um, very exciting news uh, came up very recently, like just before this show opened, which kind of changed a little bit how we were going to frame his story. And he's probably told the story like many, 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 many times <laughs> over the years. But I'm very proud to say that, you know, we had a, he was very generous and gave us quite a long, uh, you know, sort of description of what happened. And uh, it's nice that we are able to share that with you. Francine Jones, also a Montrealer, long time, um, was uh, work, finishing her degree at the old Sir George William <laughs> University at the time, now Concordia, and who also, um, was working as a, like a assistant PR, right? Uh, at the Queen Elizabeth Hotel and got to accompany Doris Giller, 
of the Giller Prize um, when she was a journalist up to the suite where, you know, where she saw and met John and Yoko. So, though, so Francine, Jill, Jerry, Christine, their stories are all in, in the bed in. And I just wanted to give you that little introduction so that we could get right into, you know, these questions and, you know, let them speak. So, so Jerry, <laughs> you met Yoko. Yeah, you've got a mic. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Bonsoir. Yeah. You met uh, Yoko in 1969, and then you worked with her again in 2008, 2009. Um, what was that like? And uh, has your experience and perception of Yoko changed in any way? Um, I, I met her for the first time when I was 14 in 1969. Uh, I had a 30-minute uh, taped interview um, of John and Yoko uh, when, I, when I met them. And many years later, I did a short animated film. Um, I edited the 30 minutes down to five minutes and had it animated by, uh, by a few artists, uh, local Toronto artists. Um, Yoko was not involved in that part of it, and when I did it, I had no uh, concept that it would be, you know, gain any kind of prominence, and it was the early days of YouTube, so what I thought uh, was that I would just dump it onto YouTube, um, and that, that's it, but it started to get prominence around the world at film festivals, and ultimately, was <laughs> nominated for an Oscar, and uh, I won an Emmy for it. It was uh, the first Emmy actually ever given for anything uh, on uh, on YouTube. Anyways, um, <laughs> leading up to that, uh, the pressure when you're involved with the Academy Awards is quite incredible, particularly if you're just a Toronto guy who has no film connections or or anything like that. And uh, I had sent a letter to Yoko. Um, um, to her offices uh, in New York, um, telling her about it. I sent her the film even before it gained any prominence and didn't hear anything back. And then um, ultimately, leading up to uh, the Oscars, um, individuals and institutions involved in it for commercial reasons wanted it included in this big theatrical film release, and I refused to do it unless Yoko... Uh, said it would be okay. And um, there's one person here who actually witnessed the trauma I was going through. Um, they were threatening me, the Academy Awards, this, this one person in particular was threatening uh, me. They were gonna pull the film from the nomination and all this kind of stuff um, uh, unless I got her backing. And I constantly tried to get in touch with her lawyers and then ultimately, a few days before I left for Los Angeles, I got a call from her a lawyer uh, who said, um, he said, I have a quote from Yoko, and it is that uh, uh, you've handled this with great <laughs> integrity, so you can do whatever you'd like. <laughs> um, uh, that was my first involvement uh, with Yoko in that respect. Anyway, she had nothing to do with the film, Many years later, I had an idea to take some prose of hers that she had lent to a friend who had an art exhibit in, in Italy, I think, called My Hometown. It was a part of a larger piece. And I had an idea to animate it. Um, that was in 2011. Um, and she graciously said yes. And not only did she say yes, she offered... Uh, that we use as the soundtrack, her song Remember Love, which was the B-side to give peace a chance, and to let us use John's strumming and play around with it as part of the soundtrack. There was no license agreement, there was no request for money, nothing. It was just an incredible, and she offered to, I was thinking of who would I get to do the, the voiceover for it, so I had ideas from people, all kinds of interesting people to do it. And then one day I got this offer through her, her representative that she'd be happy to go into a studio and record it, uh, did it, and sent it to me. Um, so the image that people have, a lot, 
not necessarily people in this room, but a lot of people have of Yoko as this person who broke up the Beatles, who dominated John, uh, and is such a difficult person to deal with. I'm sure she's difficult to deal with if she's trying to protect her interests and John's interests, and, or in the integrity of her work. But, and I know there are other people who've experienced this too, for those who are just trying to do something artistic or something meaningful with their experiences with John and Yoko, she's unbelievably gracious and open and supportive um, and uh, enthusiastic. And so that's my experience with Yoko. And to just give a brief little anecdote, um, a few years ago I was in uh, New York to meet with somebody else and whenever I would go to New York, I'd go visit her, her lawyer and just to chat and say hello. And uh, I called him uh, to say I was in New York and to see if there was time that we could have lunch or something. And uh, so we arranged a time. And then at the end, I said, um, well, if you're talking to Yoko, and I sort of said it as a joke, if you're talking to Yoko, tell her I, I'm here and I say hi. He called me back in about 10 minutes and he said, well, Yoko would like you to come over for lunch at the Dakota. And I thought it was a joke. Uh, and he said, no, seriously. So come down, I'll come with you. And I went through the Dakota, through the offices, which is beautifully, the filing system is beautifully reproduced there. There was a sarcophagus, an Egyptian sarcophagus in the mail room and all this, this stuff. And we go through the winding uh, Dakota uh, staircase and the back door we came in and it was just Yoko there was no one else there and uh, and we sat uh, the, the, the Imagine uh, piano was in the corner um, uh, and uh, we talked about things and I remember at the beginning uh, we came in the living room and she um, uh, she sat on the white couch which I think is the same white couch you see in pictures uh, with John Yoko uh, and her lawyer was gonna sit next, and she says, no, no, Jerry, you sit next to me. And I said to her, the first thing I said as we sat down, I said, you know, Yoko is a 14-year-old Beatle freak. When you came on the scene, I loved what you did with John and the stuff you were doing and the edgy stuff, the whatever, and she said, well, you were the only one. <laughs> but but uh, uh, Anyways, uh, it was just such a gracious couple of hours there, and we went in the kitchen, and she made some stuff, uh, and, and we talked, and as we left, I walked out um, of the area with her lawyer, and then she called her lawyer back in, and he came out, and he said, Yoko would like to know if you want a picture with her. And I said, well, yeah, I, and I went back in, and I said, I didn't have the temerity to asked for it. and she says, well, that's why you're going to get a picture. And she said, otherwise, who would believe that you were here? <laughs> Anyways, the most gracious person if the spirit is right. And she's the real deal, just like John was the real deal. Um, and there are a lot of celebrities and artists and intellectuals and uh, famous people who... Um, people admire uh, and when you meet them it, it's like you realize they're not really that great and uh, you know other people who are <laughs> great but uh, Yoko is uh, is an extraordinary person awesome thank you Jerry thank you so much I'd like to call on Christine now <laughs> so, you have your microphone right next to you, yeah? So you just sort of hold it a little bit towards you. It's on, yep. There you go. <laughs> you can tell I'm a novice, I'm not used to celebrity. <laughs> I'm just a simple, what did he say? I'm just a northern girl from north of England way. Now I've hit the big time in the USA. <laughs> I'm just a working girl from Yorkshire, and I was a new immigrant and English. I came to Montreal at an extremely remarkable time. It was, you know, um, Dysneuf, Soissant Neuf, right? Um, Expo, Centennial, and 
Um, we had the draft dodges coming up. Uh, Trudeau allowed them up. And we're trying to get our you know, things going here. We were artisans. I was trying to make jewelry. And um, it was a really extraordinary time. So I was lucky to be there. And then um, I was going to open a store and, and put the atelier at the back and the retail at the front. And I made this huge, big, what we call the bedspread as a room divider. And it was not anything to be a work of art or last or anything. And I just spontaneously made it quickly. And, and so that's what we have. And um, then I heard that um, John and Yoko made it through the immigration and were actually coming. And I thought, beautiful day in May. I'll, what am I going to do? Oh, I'll go and see John and Yoko. <laughs> right? And people don't believe in those days you could do that. I went to the Queen Elizabeth and I took that as a present. You've got to take a little present. And um, just rolled it in a Union Jack flag, went there. And the, the, the elevator guy, I said, oh, I want to see John. Yeah, sure, come up. <laughs> and, you know, people talk about guards and things like that. Well, not in my experience. I just walked in and, you know, opened the bedspread. <coughs> Not too much going on, so one of the photographers said, go and do that again, it was kind of neat. So, <laughs> right? And that's how I got on to, I don't know who the photographer was, didn't ask for one. And in those, I mean, I could have asked John for his shirt, he would have given it to me. Or uh, signed something. But he didn't think of that in those days. It was all just, just friendliness and love and all that. You weren't out to make money and stuff. But anyway, after that, you know, that was the end of it. I went on, lived my life. And just by accident, um, I, I had to, unfortunately, move to Toronto. I love Montreal. <laughs> I'm sorry. T Torontonians, forgive me. I'm sorry, but I lived in, I lived in Montreal till 1990. And all the best things in my life happened here. My maturity, my growth, my sp everything happened here. But you know, life demands things. I had to go to Toronto. And, but I love Montreal. It's in my heart and I cry for Montreal every day. <laughs> I love you folks. And um, anyway, I'm so happy to be here. But what happened anyway, one day I'm in a movie shop, a video store, which belongs to my friend over there. And I saw this book, which was John's book, lying there. It shouldn't have been there because they didn't do books. And I saw John and Yoko on the cover of the bed in and took a look through it. And I wasn't in there because when I first went there with the bedspread, they were just beginning out and they were not making records and stuff like that. So I came and went. Nobody knew who the hell I was. They didn't take names, phone numbers, nothing. It was just, thank you very much, bye-bye. And then... So I, I saw this on page 50-something underneath. It said, the bedspread is in the Liverpool Museum. Can you imagine? I'm an old lady now. It's like 40 years later, <laughs> right? And I don't know how it got. I never even thought how it got from the bed in to the museum in Liverpool, OK? Um, and and um, Liz at the back there, that lady was hiding <laughs> at the back. She thought this was a great story when I said, this is mine. She looked it up on the internet when I was not there and found out it was the Hare Krishnas who had donated it and given it. And she contacted the museum and said, this English lady's been in my store. She made it and I trust her, I believe her. It was not the Krishnas. Now they're ready to open. <laughs> they're ready to open this big multi-million dollar new um, gallery right? And this is going to be the iconic big attraction. And so the whole world is going to say, oh, you know, Hare Krishna's gave that. Hare Krishna, you know, we're talking about provenance. And I, I didn't, so, so they said, yeah, but, you know, anybody can kind of look for money and fame, prove it. We need proof. How do you prove 40 years after when I haven't signed it or anything? Always sign your work. Have it, yeah. have it notified. Um, so, this is the hero of my story. John and Yoko are obviously the heroes and the work they do and everything. But my hero of the story is Liz, because I, w I didn't have the internet, nothing. I'm not very good at it. She spent the next months and months 
trying to find every single person who had been at the bed in, had anything to do with it, who could say, yes, we can prove that this lady is what made the bedspread and gave it. <laughs> Try that. So after months and months, she said, Chris, I'm sorry. I can't come up with anything. You know, it's, some are dead, some have moved away, blah, blah. I'll give it one more try. So she tried one more time. And then she called me back about a week later and said, Chris, are you sitting down? Do you have champagne? I said, what is it? She said, go to your email in the library and check. I went over that. And there's that photograph. So, you know, this one photograph, that's all we had to prove the provenance of that. How lucky, how... So we have this trail of coincidences that I went in the store that day for a movie that Liz wasn't supposed to be working there, she did, but she did. The book wasn't supposed to be there, right? And we happened to read on page 54 or whatever that it was in the museum. Otherwise, today, we would still be saying that the Krishnas <laughs> donated this, right? And, but nobody could prove it, because how do you go back to the Krishnas that were in Montreal in the 60s and say, who made this thing? So this is an interesting story, but we still don't know how it got from the bed in to the museum. So anybody who wants to do some detective work and do a research paper, go with it. So this is my hero. Liz, would you please stand Liz. up? Just one. stand up, stand up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. My goodness. I love I love you too. <laughs> Gilles Goujon, journalist extraordinaire. I had my original question to you is what did that the experience, what did interviewing them at the Montreal Bed in um, teach you about being a journalist? But since then, things kind of changed with your story, so you can answer that question and, and add to it or however you want to deal with it, but you probably do want to share with us the exciting news that, that occurred very recently. I have been um, a journalist for 55 years. Uh, I started at two years old. <laughs> <coughs> And I can tell you that the only time in my life, and I've worked in 40 countries for Radio Canada, and the only time in my life that I spent uh, half an hour in, in a bed with someone I was interview, interviewing was <laughs> here in the Queen Elizabeth Hotel. I spent half an hour in the, in the bed with Yoko and John. That's it. Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> what happened is that in 1968, uh, uh, the Quebec government created Radio-Québec, which is the ancestor of Télé-Québec today. And Radio-Québec was uh, an uh, educational radio uh, station. We didn't even have uh, an antenna when we started in the first uh, the, the first, I was the first one to be hired over there as a journalist and uh, host. And the first, uh, the first program we, we did was uh, about the history of Canada. And it was broad, broadcast in all school uh, each uh, Tuesday afternoon on, on the local radio stations. And it was something that was... Uh, done to help the teachers that were teaching uh, the history of Canada. But there was, was also uh, an English section in Radio Quebec that was dedicated to uh, create that kind of uh, radio uh, show for uh, educational purpose. And uh, a producer had the uh, the idea of producing a show that would be called um, Exploring Music. It should be the history of music in the world. 
only that. <laughs> and he had the idea uh, that uh, in the history of music, the Beatles had an important, an importance. So he was in touch with the, the organization of uh, John uh, and Yoko in, in Great Britain. But then suddenly there was this bedding in Montreal. So it was, I think, on Monday morning, he told me, are you free on uh, Tuesday or Thursday afternoon? I said, yes, I'm doing another show, but I am free. Could you give me a hand? Uh, we would uh, interview uh, John Lennon. I said, OK, we'll go. That was as easy as you, you said, you just said. We just went. There were in, there were about 200 or 300 person in this room, this seven, 1742 uh, suite. It was crazy. Uh, a lot of people pretended to be journalists. <laughs> <laughs> Even if they were 14 years old. <laughs> <clears throat> but you believe a journalist, don't you? So. <laughs> Um, but I was a journalist. I've been working for 10 years as, uh, as a journalist. And we just said to someone who pretended to be in charge of something, uh, we, uh, we are from Radio Quebec, and we have asked an, an, an interview. That we have asked John to give us an interview about the influence that he got when he was a child from other musicians. He would, and uh, John Lennon accepted that we, uh, we interview him because it was to be uh, an educational uh, radio program. So the guy who was supposed to be in charge knew that we were there. We were three, the producer, the sound man, and me. And there was a, a lot of uh, journalists that came from the uh, United States because, and they were quite rough with uh, John Lennon because uh, he had smoked uh, something that he was not supposed to smoke. Uh, he were, and uh, he was against the war in Vietnam and the Americans were in Vietnam. And John and I, if we would have been Americans, we would have been drafted to go to Vietnam. This, I was 26, so uh, I, would have, I would have had to, to go to, to, to Vietnam. And a lot of people were asking questions. It was a press conference or something that they would call a press conference. And all the questions were about peace. Not against war, but pro-peace. And then some, it, it, it lasts maybe for a 45 or 60 minutes, I don't remember too much, it's 50 years ago. And then somebody stood up and said, okay guys, it's over, everybody out, except Radio Quebec. Nobody knew us, even people from Quebec, other journalists, because we didn't even have an antenna. <laughs> we, we were starting, so it took a while before people left, you know, that you don't kick a journalist like this out, you know, they, they protest, and, well, they, they got out. And suddenly, we were the three of Radio Quebec together with a guy in a bed and his wife. <laughs> As they were uh, in the bed, I had to take off my shoes because I never sleep with my shoes, you know, so. <laughs> I, I took off my shoes and I went in the bed. And uh, I remember that uh, I was not on the good side to interview directly uh, uh, John. So there was uh, Yoko who was here and John was there. So I always <laughs> have to go like this. I think that she didn't like it very much. <laughs> but that's that. And we started to talk. It's not a straight interview. And he, 
he let me understand that uh, it was funny to hear questions that were not related to peace, but to kids, to, to the music. So I was talking to a musician, not a guy who was saying stop the war. And so we started to talk. It, it, was a, it was not a straight interview. It was supposed to, to last something like eight or 10 minutes. It lasted for right, around 25 or 30 minutes, talking together, but mostly I was asking questions. And he gave me, he was very uh, helpful, he was very kind, he was generous. And sometimes uh, Yoko was whispering like that. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, uh, could you speed up? And, uh, <laughs> because they were in bed. <laughs> I think that they, they would like to be alone and they could go out from the bed and go to the bathroom, I don't know. So, but she got interested in, in the conversation. And sometimes, when, after John had answered a question, she would follow up on the question on the same, uh, same, uh, on the same thing. And so we ask about uh, the, all the, the, the people who had influenced him when he was 13, for example. He said, uh, Little Richard, Elvis Presley, and he named people. And um, that was it. It was half an hour conversation with a guy who named John Lennon and uh, his wife, jo Yoko Ono. And we left. So the producer told me, uh, is it correct? I said, well, you listened to it. Did you, did you like it? I said, he said, yes, I think it's correct. It will fit in our history of the world music. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> so we got back to Radio Quebec, and I, I just gave him a hand to, for, to, to, to do this interview, because I was the only journalist working at Radio Quebec at that time. So I got back to my, to my regular job, and I didn't hear about the, the project Exploring Music. I left Radio Quebec uh, two years after that, and got back to Radio Canada as a regular journalist. And one day, maybe 10 years after, I, was, I wondered, what has happened with that project, with this interview? It was a, an exclusive interview. Nobody had this interview. And it was not about peace, it was not about the bedding, it was about music, about creativity. And uh, I phoned to some, uh, I, I phoned to Radio Quebec and I asked, uh, could I speak to Jean-Pierre? His name is uh, Jean-Pierre Paris. So the person I talked to knew who I was, said, wait, wait a minute, Jill, wait a minute. And somebody else came to the phone and said, uh, well, you want to talk to Jean-Pierre? Yes, I want to know what happened to the, the project, the, uh, exploring music, what happened to this interview? Nobody had this, this interview. And this person told me, well, uh, Jill, I've got to tell you that uh, Jean-Pierre is dead. I said, okay, uh, I, I'll forget about it. But they, they didn't knew. I said, could you just check if this, you have somewhere this, uh, what we call in French, a carte de pouce, you know, uh, 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 the, the band on which there was the, the interview. Nobody found it. No, it, it didn't exist. I know that Jean-Pierre was working at his home sometimes. I said maybe when he died, somebody took the interview, and I don't know. The year after, I phoned back and I said, listen, I've got an idea. The, the sound man who did the interview, maybe he has a copy of the interview. And they told me that he too was dead. <laughs> so <laughs> the only person who knows that I did this interview is Yoko Ono, and I think 
that she doesn't remember me. I'm quite sure that she doesn't. <laughs> so, each time that uh, we celebrated this, uh, an anniversary of the bed in, in 79, 89, 2009, there's always somebody who phoned me, and a journalist, oh, those guys are incredible, yeah? <laughs> they, uh, to ask me to, to, to tell this story I'm telling you. And I always answer, well, this is the way it happened, but I don't know where the interview is. I never had it. it, it's gone, it's lost. Until two weeks ago. <laughs> It is the most surprising thing uh, that <laughs> 50 years later, uh, Cheryl asked me for a picture of me in 1969. I didn't find any picture, so I phoned back uh, Radio Quebec and I said, listen, I was hosting another show and you, you, you did some publicity with that show at that time. Could you have a, a picture of me at that time? I didn't have a white hair at that time. And uh, she sent me a, an email and said, this is the only picture we have and it's not very good. It's you know, a regular picture of people around a table who are working on a show. And there was another paragraph saying, El, by the way, we just found the transcription of your interview. I said, what? How come? I've been asking that for 40 years. And, and I knew that we were going to, to work here with this uh, uh, exhibition about uh, Yoko Ono. And uh, she said, um, this person told me, well, I'll send you the, uh, the transcription. This is But they have edited the interview. It was not, it did, they didn't kept, uh, Jean-Pierre didn't kept the, the 25 or 30 minutes interview. He had edited it because you, you wanted to tell the history of the music world in the world. So uh, you, even if it's John Lennon, it, it won't last half an hour, you know. It, and um, I just, uh, I said, okay, that's interesting. And then I, I discovered that they had kept the, uh, the part of the interview in which uh, Yoko Ono was talking. So the first question I asked John is, what is the importance of the classical music in your life? And he answers, it's not very important to me because it's old music and I'm only concerned with now. <laughs> Classical music is very nice, but I haven't got time for it. Then, then <laughs> the music I'm making now, I consider it classical music of the day or folk music, whichever you like to call it. So I ask him, but do you think the music you're doing now one day will become old music? Yeah. He said, yes, yeah, sure, but I hope it doesn't become like classical music as now and in intellectualized then classical music at, at that time was alive it was popular music and now it's like a museum you know it shouldn't be for forgotten and then i ask other questions and um, it, I, I ask him and when you were 13 years old what was your world of music what was the world of music in your hand, in your, in your head, in your heart? And he answers, Elvis Presley and rock and roll. At 13, that's when it happened to me. It's something that happened to him. <laughs> Before, I had been interested in music as a child, playing instruments, mouth organs, or in whatever I can lay my hands on. But I was really struck at 13 by rock and roll, mainly Elvis Presley and Little Richard. And he said, it changed my life. And then Yoko Ono gets in the conversation. 
I asked her, in your life, was it the same thing when you were 13? And she says, I am 10 years older than John. It's not true, it's six and a half years. So <laughs> I'm 10 years older than John, so it's a different generation. And when I was 13, and listen to this, it was just after the war. I was brought up in classical music tradition. So the music that I was playing was the piano and listening to all to Bach, Beethoven, Mendelssohn, Debussy, Ravel, and all those people, you know, and later Honegger, Messiaen. And then I was studying composition. So later I went into Schoenberg and Berg and Webern, and then I, I started to uh, study uh, with other people like uh, Pierre Boulez and Stockhausen. I was quite surprised. <laughs> the main interview was switching from John to her <laughs> for the purpose of this program. So they kept something like uh, eight minutes of it in this interview. And the day after I got this, the same lady sent me another email and said, hey, we got the tape. and you will be able to hear it. It's here. <laughs> you will hear, well, my voice when I was 26, but you will hear John and Yoko talking for something like eight minutes about music in their bed without anyone around. This is something you don't uh, forget, you know. I've been waiting for for this for 50 years and the the worst thing that happened to me is that 11 years after uh, I, d I was doing a, a documentary report about the election of Ronald Reagan and for television a one hour show about who's that guy that will become president of the United States and and the day before we left uh, California to come back to, uh, to Montreal, we were, the, the producer and I were in uh, a place where you buy uh, records. And they were playing and playing and playing Beatles songs and John songs. And I said, oh, what's happening? We were, it was on December 8th. And the announcers sometimes came in and said, well, we are remembering you that John Lennon was killed this morning in New York City. I froze. And that's the day when somebody killed my youth. That's it. Merci beaucoup, Gilles. Sorry for my English. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. Um, Francine, Francine Jones here. I had a two-parter for you, which is, uh, did, it seem, did it seem perfectly normal to you that famous people such as John and Yoko should be in Montreal at that time? And then, sort of like a back then and now a kind of present question, as a practicing artist yourself, what is one of your favorite Yoko Ono works or John and Yoko works and why? Oh, did you say John and Yoko? Works? Well, I, now I'm just opening it up. I'm throwing you a curveball, <laughs> but you can, you know, do with it what you will. Okay, I have a very simple little story, but they're all, all these stories seem to have a, piece, a missing piece of a puzzle. As you put them together, they sort of fit in. Um, but I have a very modest little story. Um, my question was whether it seemed perfectly normal for famous people such as John and Yoko to be in Montreal at that time. So I guess I have to sort of position myself in that. Um, out of curiosity, how many people here were present at Expo 67? Okay. All right. So I'm going to fill in a few of the um, missing blanks in a way. I know you all have heard stories about this. Um, at that point in time, 
um, to answer the question, yes, I thought it was perfectly normal for celebrities and for people to be staying in the city automatically. I was uh, working in my very, very first job, and I had landed, quite by accident, a job um, working for the area director of public relations and advertising. As his assistant, he didn't have one before, we shared the office. It was kind of like out of Mad Men, you know, everybody in the office. And uh, I was flying by the seat of my pants, trying to learn as quickly as possible, and going to school at night to get my degree at Concordia. <gasps> And that would be the beginning of 15 years at Concordia at night working full time. So uh, <clears throat> anyhow, um, John and Yoko had checked in and, you know, I think I should sort of position this because you have to understand what the city was like. And I apologize for my laryngitis. Um, we know what the reason was for the bed-in for peace and it's, you know, what we know it was in order to find a peaceful solution to the Vietnam War. But it was also a time which followed, time frame-wise, the Expo years. And I think what happened is, before Expo, a lot of people in the city doubted that anything, you know, that it would happen. Everybody was very doubtful. Um, and then it happened, and it was this amazing, amazing experience, which completely transformed the city. And in the years that followed, 1969, there was a definite feeling that Anything could be done. There was total confidence, fearless um, faith in human endeavor. And over the years, so many people from other countries had come to visit and had decided to stay here. And so there was a transformation of the landscape, the socio-cultural landscape, the economic landscape. And the city was just one big buzz. This enthusiasm continued. And it had continued with businesses that were blooming internationally. Um, and at the same time, the population that had been fairly, I would say, stayed at this prior to that, all of a sudden discovered everything, foreign food. I mean, I can remember discovering Belgian waffles for the first time, quiche Lorraine. I mean, things that today we take for granted. You know, all of this food and then all of these pavilions that had paintings and, and art and the music. So this... What had happened is that at the same time, you know, in 1969, I'd gone to work in 1968, right after Expo, a few months after it closed, as a matter of fact. And uh, so in 1969, I'm working in this hotel, and we had to position the Queen Elizabeth Hotel at this point. This was the largest hotel in North America, in Canada, 1,200 rooms, 21 bars and restaurants that were managed in Placeville Marie, downstairs, upstairs, in Central Station, and in the hotel. The whole range, everything possible. Consultants to the World Trade Center later on when it opened for the food and beverage operation. Um, so it was a revolving door for celebrities. But there was another thing, is that the hotel belonged to CN, to CN Railways, but it was managed by Hilton Canada, from the States as a wholly owned subsidiary in Canada, so they had five hotels, but the Queenie was head office. And uh, so what happened is that this hotel built over the station, and I'm sort of leaving, letting a little secret out, but had one of its elevators that went right down to the station. So that when heads of state who wanted their, their, their privacy respected came in, they were spirited in from Ottawa or wherever, from the train track to the 21st floor, while all the people were standing outside on what was then Dorchester Boulevard waiting for the cavalcade. <laughs> um, so at that point in time, John and, and, uh, and Yoko checked in, and of course there was this flurry of excitement, press, it didn't stop. Um, one of the interesting or amusing incidents was that a lot of young, not quite 14-year-olds, but about 17, 16, 17, wanted to, of course, meet them. So they had found a way to find the service stairs at the back. <laughs> and they would climb 17 flights of stairs, and when a door opened, there was a security officer <laughs> pointing to where the elevators were. 
Anyway, towards the end of this, um, of this period of time, uh, in the last weekend, the, uh, one of the writers, actually she was the feature writer for the Montreal Star, her name was Doris Giller. And uh, John, my boss, says, oh, Doris is coming over and, you know, she wants to talk to John and Yoko. Maybe you can go upstairs with them. And up until then, I really hadn't gone into the suite. It was crazy. I know that there were hundreds of people in there. And so um, she comes over and I said, okay, fine, let's go upstairs. So we go up, we take the elevator up. There's nobody. It is dead quiet. There's just all of these wires that are snaking along the floor um, that, you know, media feeds that aren't being used. And uh, John and Yoko are lying in bed with their posters up against the wall on the window. Um, so Doris gets out her little book. She's got about 10 questions. And I'm a fly on the wall, literally. I am not saying anything. I'm sitting on the side. I'm watching this show. I remember Yoko with her hair out like this. And this little child jumping on the bed, flinging flower petals from a basket in little yellow frilly panties. Um, turns out it was her daughter, Kyoko, who was about three or four at the time. So the interview goes on, everything's fine, and just as Doris is about to leave, she says, hey, John, can I have that poster? It's the one that says hairpiece. Oh, he says, sure, he stands up on the bed and he unpins it. She rolls it up and puts it in her bag. Off she goes. They check out a few days later, I don't think anything more of it. There's probably somebody else coming in. It's like a revolving door because all these people stay at this hotel. And um, a few, I guess a couple of years later, Doris and her husband moved to Toronto. She goes to the Toronto Star. And then she gets cancer and she dies. Unfortunately, she was a wonderful writer. Her husband, who adored her, wanted to pay tribute to her. So he created the Giller Prize. But 10 years passed just in, you know, 10 years ago for the 40th anniversary. By this time, my life had changed. I was no longer with the Queenie. And among the various things that I did, other than teaching marketing at Concordia, John Olson, was become a guide at the museum. So they had, a, you might remember, there was an exhibition at the time for the 40th. Mm -hmm. And in that exhibition, posters were put up. And posters were put up. They were white and black. But in museums, when something is an authentic, you have to indicate it by showing that it's not the same color, or whatever. So there's one poster that's yellow, hairpiece. And the only person who knew where it was and where it went was me. But at that time, I really didn't want to talk about it too much because I didn't want to give my age away. But I decided I'd, <laughs> I'd let it fall for this one. So I told the story. So in fact, come back to the original question, did it seem normal to me that famous people would stay at the hotel? Yes, because the city was, was bombarded with people who were quite famous, people who became famous over the years, who set up ballet companies, you know. All, the cultural landscape changed totally in the years that followed Expo. It was quite amazing. And that, uh, that buzz, that excitement, continued. It was really electric, and everybody felt it. It didn't matter who. So um, I don't think I realized the impact. And it was when they, 10 years ago, it was celebrated. And now, even more, I thought, geez, you know, how stupid was I not to realize what this was? Mm -hmm. So that's my little story. I don't know if there's anything I've left out. I wanted to see if there was, but I made some notes before, but I think I pretty well covered it. Um, about my favorite artist, the way the question was, was phrased to me as a practicing artist yourself, I, I paint and I make jewelry, what is one of your favorite works and why? And I didn't realize that it should have been related to this because I hadn't seen it. It doesn't have to be, no. no. I'll tell you, my favorite artist, is one whose name isn't a household word. Um, some of you may know him, but, I, but his name is Lionel Feininger. And he was born in 1879, he was German. And he has the most amazing scope of work. He started out as a German cartoonist and an illustrator. And he actually, his cartoons were published in the, in the Chicago Tribune. And then he switched, he discovered cubism. 
Oh, wait a minute, excuse me. No, then he, he started to paint and he created these amazingly whimsical street scenes with people that are seen from two perspectives. On the one hand, you can see the top of the roofs. <coughs> On the other one, they're all elongated from short, for shortening, they've got long legs and sort of a thinner body. So it's like you're seeing them from two positions. Then all of a sudden, after doing this, he discovers cubism and his work evolves into these massive works and they are razor sharp, they're huge, they're beautiful. Fell in love with them. So after that, he left Germany in 1937, went to New York City, lived there till the end of, till he died at 85, in 1957, I think. And when I look back, because I've got at a lot of shows at the museum, and when I think back, the one I think that I enjoyed the most <coughs> is his, and that's it. Thank you. If you have a chance, check them out online. And I, would, I would like to say thank you very much to Cheryl for having made me go back in time to that extent because I never really thought about it as much. And so thank you. Big thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Ms. Joan. <laughs> so Jerry had met Yoko at a party in New York, um, and they, you know, she recognized something in him, and they had a really um, kind of uh, complicity. What are the qualities that you saw in Jerry that you think made it so easy for him to establish a rapport with John and Yoko at the bed in, and which allowed him to be invited to stay all eight days? Yeah, that, 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 that's a wonderful question because uh, Jerry definitely felt right at home there. Uh, you've heard the, the idea that there were dozens and dozens of people all the time. Um, there were cameras everywhere. There were lights. There were film filmmakers uh, doing a film for Yoko. But he was somehow able to just focused totally on one thing and one thing alone, and that was to show the love between them. And their common feeling of knowing each other, which is very important to Yoko to be able to trust somebody, that uh, he had been to parties that she had been at, and she had actually been to a party in his, in his loft in uh, Greenwich Village uh, on... Uh, Jane Street, where he had a big swing in the middle of the floor. And, you know, she remembered that. She remembered that freedom, that feeling of being able to sit in a big swing in the middle of a loft. So, so uh, when, when he asked if he could stay the whole eight days, it was absolutely no problem. He was the only still photographer to stay the whole eight days. That's kind of a fine fine historic line to say because obviously there are thousands of pictures of the bed in out there and uh, only he has taken their uh, sincerity and their commitment and been able to use his art as a photographer to create uh, what you will see in the exhibition here. There are 19, 19 images. And I myself wondered why was it that he was so comfortable with with this, and how did he manage to get these beautiful pictures? Because he died suddenly. I never thought I would ever purchase the uh, uh, the, the archive from his estate, but you know, I ended up I ended up doing that, and I never asked him any serious questions really about about the bed. And he was a gregarious person, a larger than life personality, and you you think these people will never die, but but there he was. He did. And uh, as I've immersed myself in the art and gotten to know wonderful people, uh, I, I realized that there was a little part of his career which he kept pretty close to himself. He, and that was when he was spending some time in Los Angeles. He did shoot stills for the pornography film industry. And so he knew his way around a bed. That's really, that's really it. 
he, he knew how to get those intimate shots in that setting without feeling like he was intruding on anybody. And so I would say it was like the perfect storm for a, for a photographer. <laughs> so here, here he was, uh, you know, fed up with the uh, sit political situation in the U.S. He, he knew he couldn't stand it any longer. He needed to get out. So he came to the New York of Canada, which was Montreal and has so beautifully uh, uh, described by, by Francine. Uh, he was immediately uh, into the fashion industry and was a stringer for Time and Life magazine. Another reason why he worked so hard and stayed those eight days was because he was on assignment for Life magazine, and they had said, you will get a cover, and you will get a double-page spread. And if that happened, that made your career as a photographer. So he was, uh, he, he should have been nervous, probably, but with all that at stake, but, but he wasn't. He put his entire being into, into getting, getting the photographs. And when you see the exhibition here, as uh, Jerry said, that, uh, you know, Yoko is a very generous person, if the spirit is right, this whole exhibition in both the buildings is the right spirit. And believe me, we've all studied and, and have been inhabited by, by the bed, in, and you're very, very lucky to, to, have, uh, to have this, and, and a good long time to come and come again. You know, you'll be able to figure out when it's not so crowded, so. So that's, uh, that's how Jerry Dieter got to, uh, got to do it. And of course, you know, I am a publicist. There is my book, which is on sale in the, in the Phi Center. Exit by the gift shop. And, you, you know, you'll see this picture. They, they are so serene. He is reading to her from uh, a wonderful book, Lao Tzu, printed in 400 B.C. Or, yeah, see... Sorry, it's called before the common era. And uh, she's listening, and you would never guess that there were dozens and dozens of people there. But he captured that moment. They were also in a bubble of peace. They could turn off all the chaos and just feel the beautiful things that were, that were happening. And you can imagine how refreshed John felt as an artist with a partner like that to, to help him. Thank you so much, Jane. Perfect. Well, that brings us to Minnie York. Um, so Richie also had a close relationship with John and Yoko, and so it's pretty much it's the it's the same question. I mean, what was it about about Richie? What were those qualities that he possessed? that made it possible for him to be part of the trusted inner circle? Uh, Richie was a very humble man, for a start. Uh, but he was also um, one for social justice, very strong on social justice principles. And he had a knack of being in the right place. He was a journalist, sorry. He was a journalist and been a journalist for many years. And so uh, he had a knack for being in the right place at the right time and asking the right questions. His was a music journalist, so of course it was always about music and we have lots of interviews with John talking about music. Um, but um, from the bed-in days though, he, he developed a relationship by travelling backwards and forwards from Toronto uh, interviewing in the Apple offices and, and got to know John and Yoko on a personal kind of basis. And uh, they came into, after the Amsterdam fiasco, they then came into, into Toronto and Derek called him and uh, let's have a talk about where we go from here. And he suggested that Montreal was the place. Uh, and so... He'd, had, he'd built that trust over a, period, a long period of time. And uh, so he admired John for so many things, 
in that uh, John had this social constant consciousness about uh, music being the instrument of social change. And uh, Richie's career was based on writing about the music. He never picked up the dirt in amongst the rock and roll scene. Uh, so uh, he was very much respected on that level by, by of course, many musicians. Um, so I think that's really what it was that John saw in him. And, um, of course, his friendship with Yoko has lasted, well, till he passed in 2017. Um, he was very close to Yoko all that time as well. So that relationship, I think, is something that um, you earn. It's out of respect. And, um, yeah, he certainly did that. I think that's the simplest way to put it all. And I'd like to take this opportunity also to thank Cheryl You're for welcome. allowing us to be a part of this uh, wonderful <laughs> exhibition. Um, Richie's, uh, yes, I have many pieces here in the exhibition that have only been unearthed out of his archive. <laughs> I've been uh, digging into his, uh, yeah, it's a big job and there's been uh, uh, lots of things that have um, surfaced, but it's great to see them here in, in a, on the world stage. Um, sorry, I'm not good at this. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. He, he was in the room um, when, I, when I met John Yoko, and he was the preeminent rock journalist in Toronto at the time. I mean, he was known outside of Toronto. But he was a very thoughtful rock journalist. And as a 14-year-old, he looked so great. And you can see him in some, some of the pictures that I have. He could have been one of the Beatles. I mean, he had that kind of great great look about him but I have I, I have memories all that time back thinking this is one cool person and I remember that they had a rapport that John and, and Richie had a, had a cool rapport but anyways it's 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 very touching for me to connect with you and remember about Richie. Thanks. Yeah. Well, um, it brings me to some interview material that we've only like I said uh, Richie has an extensive archive and we're fixing broken tapes and we're doing all sorts of things and in amongst it we find interviews of uh, being at Ronnie Hawkins's house. Um, I'm not sure whether everybody's familiar with that but they did a, a trip into Toronto and they didn't want to stay in hotels so Ronnie opened up his house and so Richie would just put the recorder out and just let it roll. <laughs> it's quite interesting, some of the things that come out. It's quite interesting. But what is really beautiful, and particularly about the fire between John and Yoko in these particular interviews, is that they spoke truth right then, 1969. Fear. They want us all in fear. I, I, it's so clear Yoko saying this, you know. And so, yeah, they were well before their time, well before their time. And we love them for it. Um, we're talking about the 69 bed in with John Lennon. Of course, he's English, he's Liverpool, and the Beatles, it was all English Liverpool, the English invasion, whatever they call it. And a lot of this is like English speaking people, or from, not even from Canada, whatever. But we fail to remember that what's really that I remember strongly too, is that, you know, at the, at behind all of this, there was the Le, Le Revolution Tranquille happening in Quebec. Where are the Quebecers in this story? You know, like, this has always intrigued me. I was working, we were working in Vieux Montréal. Um, we had a workshop there. And at that time, because the Quebecers were fighting their just, just, tranquil, revolution, tranquil. René Lévesque, a wonderful man. Um, um, so we occupied that. They, these were the, the American people, men fleeing Viet, the Vietnam War. And the English immigrants trying to make roots here. We were all artisans. And the draft dodgers also were, didn't want to bum off the government. They were making candles and leather work and craft work. And behind at the same time, you had this Quebec revolution going on. So it was 
really, really complex because we were not, we were so new here that we didn't have any bad feelings about anyone. We loved everybody. You know, we didn't, we didn't have any historical reason to, to not like anybody. So we loved, <laughs> right? And, and so, you know, when the bomb started going off, it, it's like, what have we come to? Like, what, we didn't know what was going on. And we didn't have a deep historical knowledge. Right? I mean, let's face it. Being English, you have a historical knowledge of colonialism, you know. Um, so there was, there was this understanding that there was, at least me being British and knowing of colonialism, that I voted for René Lévesque. And, you know, you could lose friends by doing that. But I explained, because René Lévesque was not a racist, he was socialist, and he wanted justice for everyone. And, but after he died, you know, things changed, and the government people changed, and it became quite unpleasant at times. But René Lévesque started off La Révolution Tranquille very wonderfully. You know, he took power in the right way from the church, and you know, he didn't oppress the church, but he said, we should do education and health. It's best for the people, etc., etc. And And he did the, um, he brought out these colleges so that the Quebec kids could get access to higher education. What was it called? The, um, the CJEPs. You know, he did these within the small time he had before he died. So let's just not forget what was going on when the bedding was going on. <laughs> At the same time, you know, solitudes, de solitude, mm -hmm. in a way. That's so right on, Christine. I mean, it's actually an amazing um, observation. And, you know, the film that starts off the exhibition, we really uh, wanted to include the, Les Maîtres Chez Nous, you know, Révolution Tranquille, everything that was going on as part of, you know, exactly. the context at the time. and. And it's just brilliant, you know, what you're bringing up. And it's a good segue to open it up. I mean, I was also very concerned if we have a representation uh, uh, Québécois et francophone. And, and like, it's like we wanted, we need, it's like another layer of research that we can do by making, you know, kind of this public forum so that we can, more people's stories can come forward. And so I would just, we don't have a lot of time, but is there anybody here who would who either has a question or would like to share a story? Gentlemen uh, over there, I just want to know, like, where were you when John Lennon passed away? Uh, how did you find out about it? How did you feel that day? What kind of an impact did it have on you? I'm a lawyer. Don't hold that against me. Um, <laughs> Well, you probably should. But anyways, uh, I, uh, I was an articling student. I don't know what you would call it in Quebec, but I, was, I, I graduated from law school and was at, at a law firm. And I had uh, a one-year-old son, just under, uh, under a year. And uh, I had been working at the office very, very late um, and then came home and crashed and went to sleep but I would do the morning feedings. And um, I had a little transistor radio, the, the midnight, the, the, in the middle of the night sort of feedings, a little transistor uh, radio on the table. And it was four in the morning or something like that. And I put on the radio, it was very, very low. And um, it was in the middle of uh, a song from um, Double Fantasy, which had just come out and was, um, uh, I can't remember which song it was. It might have been starting over. Anyways, um, the song ended, and the uh, announcer said, John Lennon dead uh, by a bullet. And, it, it, you know, I'm holding, you know, a baby. And uh, it was just, you know, what, what can you say? This is horrible. You know, of all the, 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 the rock stars, um, he was the last person you would have expected to be murdered, you know? Like, not that you want anybody to be murdered, right? 
but you know, if it was one of the Rolling Stones, you would have been upset, but you would have thought, <laughs> well, you know, they were pushing the envelope, they were asking for it, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm, that, you wouldn't want anyone to be hurt, but you know, it was just, I mean, everything that he, the Beatles were about and everything that he was about and what he did with, John, uh, with Yoko, uh, it was just, anyways, that's, that's where I was. No, but 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 you know, as as you said, you know, when when you heard the news, it was the end of your childhood. Uh, that that so resonated with me, because I felt it. It was like, you know, it was as when my father died. It was, uh, and and in some ways, even even more so because of. You know, my father was my father, but but John Lennon, the Beatles, it was the end of the joy of the 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 unbridled joy. And so what you said was correct. Peace man. John F. Kennedy died the same way, and John Lennon died the same way. They were talking about peace. Gandhi, Kennedy, and Lennon, I think. Yeah. The way they died, after always asking the people to live as peacefully, yeah. you cannot forget. When you're North American, you, you, you don't forget that. A little, a little something to that from my, from my research. Uh, um, the reason why they did it in a hotel is because they knew that if you stood up in front of a large crowd of people, if you gave a big talk, if you were you know, out in public talking at a lectern, you could be murdered like the previous year, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. And if you did it in a place like a hotel room, it was a controlled atmosphere. You could piggyback on the security from the, uh, the hotel itself. And should anything untoward happen, there would be people right there to, you know, head it off at the pass. And, uh, you know, that's why they did it in the, in the hotel room. But one thing they did is that you remember that there were half a million people in Washington, D.C., protesting against the war. Thousands and thousands of people were protesting in the United States, in, uh, everywhere in the world. So what could they do to, to, do, to take the attention of the people without going with thousands and thousands of people in the street? You lay to bed. You stay in your bed. You just put a stop on the, all the, the, the boiling situation. It's like if, when, you, when you stop talking, people listen more. You see, I just stopped three seconds. <laughs> well, Yoko had a long history of using media to uh, get her message across. So she uh, would place a, you know, an, an ad in the Times, uh, the New York Times, before she met Lennon. And it wasn't be like, come to this gallery and see my work. It was her small, perfect phrases or a call to action of some sort. And uh, so by, by uh, applying modern methods, uh, which is exactly in the unpublished interview, which is in the gallery there, like, like yourself, I ended up with an, an unpublished interview because the story never ran in Life magazine. Uh, they, um, they were able to use media, modern methods, to, to get their message by being still. We have one more intervention here, and um, here you go. Yes, uh, I heard another story about the 14-year-old uh, journalist. Uh, is uh, you went to have uh, equipment, and you said, uh, "I have an, an interview uh, with John uh, Lennon. Could I have uh, equipment?" Uh, or, or maybe it was also l later that you went with the. Uh, interview to the radio or other place, and uh, people said, uh, "You, a kid, you went uh, 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 with John uh, Lennon to have an interview." So uh, a lot of uh, people did not trust this. Uh, 
So what was the uh, anecdote about that? Uh, merci, monsieur. C'est une bonne question. Um, when I, when I, uh, when I, it was a Sunday night, I'll make a long story very short, but it was a Sunday night, there was a rumor that John Lennon was spotted with Yoko Ono at the Toronto airport. It was on a radio station, Chum FM, for anybody who knew that. And uh, the next morning I had a plan, I was going to go find him. So uh, I didn't go to school, I didn't tell anybody, I dressed in a way that I thought a reporter uh, <laughs> would look like, and I, I didn't look like a reporter. Um, and I took my brother's Super 8 camera, I didn't know if there was film, I took my sister's Kodak uh, brownie camera that you would hang over your neck and pull a visor, visor up. Uh, um, and I went to the King Edward Hotel, which is where the Beatles had stayed when they were in Toronto before. I went to the top floor around seven in the morning, knocked on every door until I found them. And they let me, they thought it was funny, and they let me stay in there. And Richie was there at one point, I can't remember when, I don't think he was there at the beginning, but I was there from eight in the morning till about one. And then people were asked to leave, and then I asked, uh, I lingered around a little bit, and I took the long way out, and John was in the bedroom trying to push a, a, a seat chest, a luggage seat chest on, onto the bed. Um, and God or, or somebody inspired me to say, as we're pushing, um, can I come back later with a tape recorder and interview in Yoko for Peace? And he said, yeah, great idea. Yoko, Yoko, Derek. Derek Taylor was the Beatles uh, PR guy. They came in and this kid is in the bedroom. I mean, today it would be a shocking story, right? But this kid is there and John's saying, hey, you got a great idea about Pete. We'll talk about peace. We'll take it to a school. Yoko, that's why we're doing it. And she was excited. And he said, okay, set it up to Derek Taylor. And I left. So to make a long story short, I went to various places, went to my school, caused pandemonium, and then the vice principal uh, 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 came out because there was a mini riot. I had the Two Virgins album that I brought and was showing everybody this. Uh, and the vice principal told me to, you know, go home, right? <laughs> so I went home and I literally passed out. No one was home, I passed out, and I woke up in a cold sweat. The first time I, I had that kind of awakening, it happens frequently now, but um, I woke up in a cold sweat. I didn't have a tape recorder. And so I called Chum, the, the radio station in Toronto. And by now, it was confirmed that John and Yoko were in Toronto, and I called the news desk, and I said, hi, I've got an exclusive with, it was more like this, hi, I got it. this with John Lennon at six o'clock. Uh, and the guy says, yeah, all right. And I said, no, you can call the King Edward, ask for Derek Taylor, and here's my number. Five minutes later, uh, he called back and he said, oh, hi, yeah. Okay, um, so we'll have someone at the King Edward at the bar on the main floor and we'll have a tape recorder and uh and i said well if you do that then you can play my tape um on the news and great okay anyways so i go down to the king edward and it's there the police the rcmp uh, toronto is way more stuck up than montreal okay so there are police there are ropes there's all kinds of stuff going on I snuck in, uh, and there was a bar, there was a guy with a big reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, and I said, are you from Chum? And he said, yeah. He says, you're the kid? And, yeah. <laughs> so this, this journalist, this journalist, a rock journalist, is there being a guy carrying up a tape recorder. We go up, and by then, um, there, were, there was a row of reporters, mostly from New York, because uh, John had not yet said anything about the Vietnam War. You knew it was coming. You knew that they were going to say something about it, and this whole peace bed and thing. And he hadn't been allowed into the United States for a year and a half or so. They're waiting there, seated, um, 
um, hoping to get in. What they didn't know is they had a plan, thanks to Richie, uh, to leave Toronto and sneak out and go to Montreal. So it was six o'clock, the door opened, Derek Taylor said, where's the kid? Uh, I said, right here. I walked by the New York Times or whatever, went in, did the interview. I, I stopped the interview. To talk about the generosity uh, of, of them, um, you have all this press waiting to speak to them, and there's this kid asking nutty questions, some good questions, and um, I, at one, you can hear it on the tape. I say, well, okay, well, thank you, John and Yoko, and then I stayed there for a bit more. Anyways, to get to your, your question, in those days, obviously, so I had f film, uh, still footage, I had Super 8 footage, and there was this tape, in interview, but it wasn't instant. It wasn't like you could look at your phone and, and, and do something. In those days, in Toronto, it might have been different in Montreal, but uh, it would take two weeks to get a, your film developed, right? So um, Chum, the guy who didn't have the guts to ask one, you would have thought he would have asked some questions in the middle, uh, in the middle of the interview and say, ah, just one second, kid. Hey, John, what? Um, he went. And literally within about an hour on Chum on the news, and in those days it would be every 15 minutes there'd be a, a news, a breaking news on Chum. So it would be the Chum News asked John Lennon what kids could sh do for, pe they would cut my voice out, and you'd hear John <laughs> say that the first, the first news item was, well, you can piss for peace, or don't piss for peace, or go to school for peace, or don't go to school for peace. And then 15 minutes later, Chum News asked John Lennon, whatever. I'm a 14-year-old kid who they just sort of exploited. Anyways, nobody believed that I had met them because I didn't have any photos. So for about a week or two, and all this time Chum is doing all these, <laughs> right, stealing my interview. And, and I, I would say, that's me, that's me, yeah, right. Anyways, uh, about a week into this, I went to the Chum headquarters, which then was in mid-downtown Toronto. That was sort of a small thing. They had a big radio station sort of sign. and Because I would call and say, where's my tape? Where's my tape? And the guy would, like, blow me off. So I went there, and I caused a scene. I was yelling and screaming, and I said, I'm going to call the police, I call the police, and I was just going nuts until they came out and they just gave me the, uh, the, the tape. So that's, that's a long-winded story, but that's basically what happened. And it w wasn't until I had that tape. I remember that night, my uncle Mike had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. He came over, and we listened to it, and my brother, who didn't believe this story, my older brother, I remember in the kitchen, and I, I still, my desk is still the kitchen table, <laughs> The kitchen, my father, my mother, uh, my uncle, my brother, like my brother's jaw dropped, right? And then a few days later, I had the, I found the, the, the fo I had the photos and then the rest is history. But anyways, that's the story.